Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. Where the hell is my fully autonomous car? For years, we've been hearing about a self-driving revolution that's supposed to reduce traffic accidents. We'd no longer have to keep our hands on the wheel or our eyes on the road, which would free us up to read or get some work done in the car. Sounds awesome. But so far, the hype has exceeded reality. In 2013, Google said fully autonomous cars would be on the road in three to five years. It's been six, and all we've got are models that are far from self-driving. Most require significant human oversight. And even those cars aren't widely available or affordable. Plus, fundamental technical questions remain, and a host of unintended consequences, ranging from job displacement to motion sickness, are starting to emerge. So. What's preventing the driverless car utopia? And can it ever live up to our great expectations? Self-driving cars don't get drunk. They don't get high. They don't text behind the wheel. They won't fly into an irrational road rage and create havoc. In other words, they have the potential to be much better drivers than us imperfect, distractible, and easy to anger human beings. And keep in mind, some 1.35 million people die every year in automobile accidents. In the US, humans are at fault in 94% of crashes, and the economic damage reaches almost a trillion dollars annually. Meanwhile, the average American spends nearly 300 hours each year in their car. That's over seven full work weeks. That's a ton of potential productivity lost. Having a general sense of all this, and knowing that autonomous cars can eliminate or at least mitigate these issues, I was excited to watch Neha's recent Beam piece on self-driving technology. The industry leaders she spoke to had some cool demo candy to show, some futuristic looking tech, but they also had no clear time frame. And I'm starting to worry. Will the autonomous car go the way of the flying car? That is, that thing that we're always promised but never actually get. Roboticist John Leonard, an MIT professor and vice president of automated driving research at Toyota, told me we're likely decades away from fully self-driving cars zipping around our roads. He noted that it's one thing to demo a prototype in a place with good weather and ideal driving conditions, but it's gonna take a long time for artificial intelligence systems to deal with the unexpected, like road construction and adverse weather. Now, things like snow, fog, and intense sunlight can mess with the sensors on an autonomous vehicle. So that's a technical problem that needs to be solved. But something like navigating around road construction, Leonard explained that's a mix of physics and social intelligence. The latter is something robots might struggle with. Consider, a human driver sees a construction worker in the middle of the road detouring cars on some weird, otherwise illegal detour. We don't really think twice in these scenarios. We make the adjustment and go along our way. Yet for an autonomous vehicle, these situations are very confusing. I mean, how does a computer know when to break the rules? Does it follow the traffic light, which is red, or the dude who's emphatically waving you to ignore the traffic light? Likewise, a lot of driving is communication. At a four-way stop sign, you might give a hand signal to another driver offering the right of way, or you might lock eyes and give a head nod to a pedestrian, letting her know you'll wait for her to cross. This back and forth, often involving subtle body language, is a real challenge for autonomous cars. The experts I spoke to also said that driverless cars have an intuition problem. That is, it's tough for them to predict what's about to happen. For instance, if there's a guy standing on the corner just loitering, we humans can quickly decipher that and continue along our merry way. But if an autonomous vehicle sees a guy on the corner, it might think he's preparing to cross the road. So the car waits and waits and waits. That's why Rodney Brooks, another famous roboticist from MIT, has predicted that autonomous vehicles will be pretty wimpy drivers. Writing in IEEE -E -E Spectrum magazine, he describes a scenario where the sidewalk is covered in snow, forcing pedestrians to walk on the edge of the road. Regular drivers know it's okay to cautiously drive around these people, but an autonomous vehicle might not risk it. It will plod along at a safe distance, traveling at the walker's pace. You can easily imagine traffic backing up. Horns start honking. There's road rage. It's not a good situation. Brooks thinks scenarios like this will create a level of resentment towards driverless cars, especially since they will first be owned by wealthy people who can deploy them to run errands. He concludes, quote, the rich will have a whole new way to alienate the rest of society. In a world where class resentment is already extremely high, see my piece on the Yellow Vest movement, 
This is no good, especially since a study at the Center for Global Policy Solutions estimates that driverless cars can eliminate some 4 million American jobs. Over 93% of the people likely to be impacted lack a college degree, so finding another gig might be difficult. And keep in mind, people don't really need a reason to hate tech. There's already a hostility towards innovation, like people cutting the cords at Tesla charging stations, or that poor hitchhiking robot that was decapitated just two weeks into its US journey. Plus, since flesh and blood drivers and pedestrians know that autonomous cars are programmed to avoid accidents, to be wimpy drivers, we humans might be tempted to treat them rudely. Srikanth Sarapali, an engineering professor at Texas A&M, told me the autonomous car he's testing on campus is often cut off. Basically, people take advantage of it because they know there's no chance of retribution, as opposed to the time I accidentally cut off a car and the driver tried to run me off the road. All of these problems are connected to an inconvenient truth. Driverless cars will have to share the road with human beings. These two groups will have to get used to one another in order for the autonomous revolution to fully arrive. But in the absence of this integration, Nick Oliver, a professor of management at the University of Edinburgh, explained to me that autonomous cars will likely be segregated from other types of traffic in the foreseeable future. Perhaps they'll get a dedicated lane in certain areas. Eventually, maybe down the line, we might see cities redesigned to accommodate driverless cars, but that's a way off. I mean, many cities are struggling to integrate scooters. However, even if autonomous vehicles win the battle for our hearts and minds and bring increased safety to our roads, they might not increase our productivity as much as we might imagine. Two words, motion sickness. If you're like me, you can't look at a book or a screen in a moving car without getting nauseous. In fact, an experiment revealed that the ability to perform a simple reading task was reduced by 40% when the subjects were being driven around at normal speeds. Now, motion sickness occurs when the sensory system in our inner ears tells our brains that we're moving, but our eyes think we're at rest because we're staring at a fixed object like a book. These mixed messages make us feel ill. It's not a problem for drivers because their eyes are on the moving road, so their eyes and ears are in sync. But in our driverless future, in which everyone is a passenger, the issue will be much more widespread and can eat into any gains in productivity. As an aside, I spoke to a researcher who thinks he has a solution. When he was at the University of Michigan, Michael Savak and a colleague, Brandon Schodel, developed the concept of placing a series of lights in the periphery of a passenger's vision. These lights would mimic the motion of the car, thereby reminding your eyes that you're on the move. Savak says these lights could be installed in a pair of goggles or placed in the interior of a vehicle. But even if that works, Savak said working in a car presents other issues. If you're on your laptop, that becomes a potentially dangerous projectile if you're in a car crash, ditto with a book. Savak also noted that some driverless car designs, like the one Neha rode in, have backwards facing seats. So how will the airbags work? And if you're tempted to recline and take a nap while a piece of AI drives your car, that puts you in a really compromising safety position in the event of an accident. But look, despite all these problems I've outlined, and others, like the affordability of driverless cars and how they might restructure the auto industry, there's still a technology worth pursuing. The most dangerous thing most of us do on a regular basis is get in a car. If we can take the risk out of that, let's do it. But let's also approach this piece of tech with eyes wide open, with questions and skepticism. Because in the recent past, we've excitedly welcomed all types of innovation without fully understanding the unintended consequences. So hopefully, the long time it's gonna take to get to the autonomous driving revolution is a blessing in disguise. Because now, we have the time to anticipate the problems and work towards the solutions. Okay, I'm gonna go live my life.